minutes to to log in. So we'll get started in a couple minutes. Hello, everyone coming in. Welcome to Master Gardeners Presents. We'll get started in a couple minutes and give people a chance to log in and get settled. If you don't have paper and pen nearby, you might want to get some because you might want to take notes with this one. If you are familiar with Zoom, you're not going to see yourself. You might be seeing me right now because I'm talking um, and the perennial report card picture here. You won't see yourself, but if you're having a problem with something like with sound or anything, um, there's a chat down at the bottom. There's also a Q&A down at the bottom. You can put your questions in there like during the thing. We'll do questions at the end. Um, and that's kind of how Zoom works here. <laughs> we'll give everyone a few minutes to get in. All right, so I'm going to get us started because I know we have a lot to go through today. Um, welcome everyone to Master Gardeners Presents. I'm Jill I, Vanning. I am a Master Gardener and I work for the Kimberly Public Library um, who's hosting this. Um, we are here today with talking about perennials with Kathy Baum. Kathy does the buying for the Master Gardeners plant sale that's coming up on May 20th. And she's going to let us know what's going to be there and what some of our favorite perennials are. And um, yeah. Kathy, when you're ready, you can take it. I'm ready. So, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. You said ready. I thought, am I really ready? Okay. <laughs> so tonight we're going to, uh, every year I've been, uh, for about the last 18 years, I've been buying the plants for the Master Gardener plant sale. Uh, and then we're going to have, I'm going to have a little bit of uh, cultural information, uh, just to, to uh, spread some information and uh, good education about how to take care of them. So um, with that, we'll start with my first slide. Um, I always like to announce that we're the Outagamie County Master Gardener Association. We're an active group of well-organized, we're hoping, <laughs> dedicated horticultural volunteers providing education and service to the community. All the sales from this plant sale go right back into the community. Uh, we actually, I think we still have a, um, a grant, uh, grants that we give out for projects and education. Uh, and so, so it's really important. I think they always say buy local and um, I think when you buy from us, you're going to get uh, great growing plants, plus it's going to beautify your community. Okay, so uh, we're in fake spring, as you can <laughs> see uh, from this. Uh, I'm like, I have I have so many plants in my garage right now. Uh, these are my plants. This is attached garage. This drives my husband crazy every single year, but I'm just going to show you some some how exasperating it is right now, but this is in winter. I stack all these in the fall uh, because our garage doesn't get below like 39 or 38 degrees. And that's the perfect, perfect, well, I already have way too many plants. So I have to winter them over. So this is uh, what they look like in uh, February. And they wanna go outside really, really, really bad. So this is what they look like two weeks ago already. They're even bigger than this now but I can't put them out because the weather is just way too cold. Now there are some things that are fantastic about that because uh, because we're having like a little cooler than normal, the plants aren't shooting out of the ground yet. And which I'm hoping that's gonna mean that we're not gonna, we're gonna be able to avoid a hard freeze which nips uh, plants back and I that's even worse. So I'm hoping to get these out on Wednesday. I heard 
the weather guy said it's going to be like 35 at night. <laughs> so then I can put them out in the greenhouse. Even some of the perennials can go right outside. They're pretty tough. So anyway, so when I go to select, I think I showed you the slide last year, but when I go to select plants, these, this is really the format I use. Um, I'm using Achillea, which is yarrow, just uh, garden yarrow. Um, because I was, people are usually pretty familiar with that plant. Um, and then I wanted to show you there's like, oh, there might be several, maybe there's a hundred species of Kalia, so, um, or yarrow. So I, Kalia would be the genus. And so then you've got uh, Achillea Achillea pendulina, and that's the genus plus the species. And there are a lot of species in that, in that genera. And then you've got, uh, Achillea carnation gold, which is genus species and cultivar. So, uh, and that would just be called uh, fern leaf yarrow or carnation gold. So how do I use this guide? Well, there are certain things that I, plants that I feel in each genus that are more garden worthy. Some of them are out, outright weeds and some of them, I mean, in, or they won't grow in our area. So I do a lot of, uh, research when I'm picking out plants for the plant sale. I don't want you to buy something. If I think something's going to be even slightly tender, and I think I just um, I purchased one plant that might be, but otherwise I'm not going to buy it if I don't think it's not going to grow really well in this area. So anyway, so this is where we get the variety of probably a huge, maybe a couple thousand plants from Walter's Gardens. Now Walter's Garden supplies the middle Northern gardens, uh, they're out in Michigan, out in Michigan, and uh, that's where I get the majority of our plugs from. Uh, they're a fantastic company. They, they are, I can pretty much guarantee they'll be, the plants will be disease free. They'll be well grown. Uh, it's really hard to ship 2000 plants to somebody's house, but they do a great job of that. And so um, they have, and there's also on this slide too, it says perennial resource on the bottom.com. And so you can really look up a lot of these plants on that on that website. Now, usually Jill, she publishes this to the library site when I'm done. So if you don't like to take notes and you just wanna enjoy the, the uh, slideshow, then you can go back and review it later. Okay, so without tissue culture, this is basically how Walters Gardens and many other uh, places like Monrovia and all the different plant places usually get everything from tissue culture. And what tissue culture is, is that on the growing tips of the roots, that's called meristem. And what they do is they take a very fine razor from that growing tip and they cut little bitty teensy teensy slices off of that. And then they put them in this um, a growing medium and they'll put maybe 50 to 100 or maybe more into a test tube, maybe less. And then this test tube will make these uh, little bitty divisions sprout. Now, without tissue culture, we wouldn't be able to afford any of the plants I'm showing you because <laughs> everything would be have to be by division. And that would be really super slow process. So the only reason gardening, I think, has just gone absolutely crazy with so many fun plants is because of tissue culture. And this is how Walter's Garden produces a large amount of their plants. Now, a lot of their plants are also field grown too. So it's a really interesting, uh, interesting um, uh, process if you ever want to look into it deeper. Okay, so then when we purchase the plants, we purchase them, this is as tubers or bare root or these plugs here. And uh, in, they come in various sizes and everything. So when they're shipped to my house in several boxes, I think 70 cases this year, uh, they, uh, they come in those three forms. This is the order. It's taking up my garage. A lot of it's on the other side of the garage. And then this is more of the order on my porch. So I'm trying to force these to sprout a little earlier so that it doesn't look like when I'm selling you hibiscus that it's dead sticks in a pot because hibiscus comes up very, very late. And it's very stubborn to, to a bud. So I'm trying something new this year. I put them in my warm porch and see if they'll start growing faster. So these are the master gardeners that come over to my house 
when, well, they're coming this Saturday to pot up all those beautiful plants. Here they are right here. But then something strange happened last year where uh, some of the master gardeners, one of them got so excited when he saw the plants that <laughs> we had to call an ambulance <laughs> to our home. And um, here it is where they just loaded him in the ambulance. I'm just kidding. He wasn't excited. He forgot to, he didn't eat or drink something in the morning. So when you come and you're working out in your yard <laughs> during the, a hot day, please hydrate. <laughs> so this was quite a bit of excitement at our house for about an hour. Okay, so then the other thing that we do for Master Gardener Plant Sale is we do plant divisions. Um, all of our yards, in order to have a plant divided from somebody's yard, they have to be certified to be jumping worm free. Jumping worms, a whole nother talk on, uh, uh, it's an invasive uh, uh, worm that looks just like an earthworm, but it uh, has a ferocious appetite. And we don't wanna spread that. So any play, anytime you get a potted plant from our plant sale, they had to have a certification. So, but they do do some divisions. Okay, so just for just cultural information, these are some plants that, re, that resent being divided and uh, it should be avoided. So what I'm kind of saying about this is, uh, put it where you want it to live. So don't think, oh, I'll put that here and see if it looks nice and then I'll maybe move it in a couple of years. Some people have luck, but otherwise these are, a few, just a few of them that really do not like to be divided. A lot of them have uh, tap roots and, uh, and that's why they like to put that down and stay there. So plants that rarely need division are in, on, in, this, in this category. It doesn't mean they can't be divided. It's just that it's awesome that you don't have to divide them. Because a lot of perennials really, in order to be keep flowering, they're great flowering habit and stuff, and uh, they get too tight in the roots and then they stop flowering and they need division just to uh, perk them back up. But these here don't. And these are actually some of my absolute favorites because honestly, I just don't like to work that hard. Okay, so another thing is thinking about your plant requirements. So um, I think that this is really frustrating for some people. Now here's a garden here and they have installed all plants that like the same cultural, um, the same cultural needs, like the same kind of soil, the same kind of water requirements. All of these like well drained. Uh, they're using rocks here because they can take the heat. Not all, all not all flower beds should use rocks because sometimes they can burn plants because of the reflecting sun. But these all um, like drier location. They don't need water. Uh, very often. So you can see that they put all the same ones together. So the next slide is, this is your neighbors laughing at you because you put Russian sage right next to Lichularia. So can these two plants be grown in the same flower bed? They can. Russian sage needs very, very well-drained soil. It likes a lot, it likes a lot of sun, but the big thing that will damage it the most is too, being too wet. So um, and Ligularia loves lots of water. It can also take full sun, uh, but you have to make sure that it's got very damp roots. So you can, a little trick to the trade is, is that you can put Ligularia on a lower level here and you can put Russian sage up here. Now this is shaded. I imagine this is full sun. Uh, but if you raise the bed inside of another bed, and get that drainage better, you can grow some of those plants together. But you just have to just adjust your flower bed so that it can take them. Because actually they would look beautiful together, but they don't like the same cultural conditions. So you could change those conditions and make this really well-drained soil, put your Russian sage up higher, put your ligularia down here where it's gonna collect water more. It can work. Okay, so the basic light requirements. So I have that on that description of what kind of light your plant's gonna need or do best in. And usually, believe it or not, plants do better in more light, not less. So if it says full sun, that's what you're, where your plant's gonna do really, really well if you give it this conditions. Part sun, to me, part sun is, is sun that happens afternoon. Like you might have a little more shade in the morning, you know, really bright, intense light after 12 o'clock. 
part shade to me is early morning sun, but then it kind of gets cast over after, after the afternoon. And then full shade is four hours of less of direct sun. So keep that in mind when uh, you'll see the slides all have cultural information on them. So keep that in mind when you're getting ready to plant. So now I'm gonna go through the plants and why I purchased them. Um, and some of them are just because it's just such a diverse group of plants. And so I want a little bit of something for everybody. So I always try to choose a hollyhock, this old fashioned cottage garden plant. I think they're, they do best next to the side of a building on the south side or the west side of a building because they tend to be very tall. Although this variety is shorter than average. And I like to think that the newer varieties, most of the time, uh, what they do when they cultivate a, new, uh, cultivate a new variety, they usually make an attribute that's more beneficial, like a thicker stem that might stand up to more wind. But even so, these can get really leggy. These, and then a new thing I did this year too is when you see the word new here, that means this just is coming on the market this year. So uh, the minute I get an email that Walters is releasing their list of brand new, never to the market plants. I'm on the website within five minutes ordering them. Because if I don't do that, we won't get them. That's how fast these sell out. So um, I love alliums because uh, they give you a little bit of like late summer color, but deer and rabbits do not like them because they, they're onion, they're in the onion family. But they bloom for a very long time and they're just a, just a great addition to the garden. I always order A insomnia, um, which is blue star. I love the light blue color. They're very shrub-like. They often have fantastic fall color depending on how much sun they get. Uh, they are deer resistant. And that's really key to me is how much, I was just out today before I did this presentation, uh, just spreading blood mill on top of my hostas that are coming up. I noticed the rabbits have chewed off, or the deer, maybe deer, have already chewed off all the tops of the ones that have come up. So when I see that this resists deer, I'm very excited. So here's another one. This is an enemy, fall in love. This was on the market. I think it was released like maybe three years ago. Um, this is another great fall edition. Uh, well, when I say fall, late summer. And I just think that's a time when the gardens are kind of waning and going down. And then you get these, you, you put these, between your other summer bloomers and and uh, keeps your garden going for a lot longer. Really beautiful. The other thing about this plant, it has great foliage. So it looks pretty all summer and then it just is crazy with blooms. Um, this is an old fashioned, this is a uh, Columbine. This is one of their newer uh, early bird series. And this nice garden, cottage garden plant, this is a red and white variety. It does say it's resistant to rabbits. And, and usually if something's rabbit resistant, it's more, it might be deer resistant too. They kind of like the same thing. And all this information you see here that comes right off of Walter's Gardens website. This is the only plant that I took a chance on this year because honestly, I just don't think we're, I think we're barely zone five anymore. I think we're for sure five B. Uh, we used to be four A. And so you would never be able to get by with this plant in four A. So, but now I think it's worth taking a chance on. You can see here, it's planted with some uh, bucharas. It looks really, really beautiful. I, I looked at it, I opened the box when they came last week and they are just stunning. So this is a ginger. Um, everybody's heard of wild ginger or they have, uh, um, uh, Canadian ginger, and I think there's an English variety too. But this is the only variegated one that I've seen. This one's going to like shade, <laughs> more shade. Uh, this is a Sclepius uh, butterfly weed. Everyone knows about the orange one, which is used a lot in native uh, native prairie gardens. And uh, someone developed this beautiful yellow shade, and this is going to like the same conditions as um, Russian sage. It's going to like something well-drained, uh, sandy soils will be great in. Uh, and boy, butterfly weed is the word for it because this is going to be a great pollinator. Uh, this just won an award. This is the first year this is out. Um, I already have a lot of people saying, did you get that? Did you get that? So this is a newest still be called Dark Side of the Moon. Uh, it's going to have 
really great dark foliage, which is looks really pretty against some of the yellows here. Uh, and it also is gonna have beautiful flowers. I'm really super excited about this one. This is gonna take not deep shade because when things have these like reddish leaves to them, they actually do get more color, deeper color in sun. But obviously this one's gonna like part sun. So I'm saying early morning, early morning sun and at noon you wanna have it be casting a shower, sh uh, shadow. This is gonna be really pretty. And here's a Baptisia. This is the newest variety called Honey Roasted. So it's going to have a yellow and a uh, like kind of a rusty colored uh, uh, blossom. But Baptisias are fantastic. These are one of your taproot plants. So you put it where you're going to love it forever. Um, I think you could easily transfer, transplant this within two to three years. But after that, I think it'd be very difficult. Um, this The foliage always has a bluish cast to it. So it has a really great shrub-like appearance when it's done blooming but these seed heads dry beautifully and they look really great in dried arrangements. Every year they're coming out with a new color and I try to get the newest variety. And this one is it this year. Virginia, um, I don't know why people don't use this more often. This is literally evergreen all winter and it has really, really unique flowers, but this one's brand new because it's very, very rippled. The leaves are, and you can see that the new growth is lighter green and with the uh, season growth is darker. It has really a neat bicolor effect. Uh, they look good in the pots already. <laughs> so they're small, but they really look amazing. They usually have reddish stems to them. So they're really unique. This loves, this will take a lot of shade. Uh, and I've seen it growing in quite sunny areas too. So it's very versatile. Um, love it. And it's deer and rabbit resistant. This is Bernera or uh, or Siberian Bugas, but I think Bernera is probably the easier way to say this. Um, I usually order one of these. This has been on the market probably for 10 years, but I love the uh, light color. This one will do great in shade, almost deep shade really. And I noticed that the seedlings, um, a lot of people don't like things that seed, but I love this because it literally almost always seeds true to form. So you'll get a lot of these extra little silver ones. They pop up all over. I just leave them. They're really charming. Um, I've never had rabbits eat this. It's kind of a fuzzy, weird feeling to it, like sandpaper. And so the deer don't like it either. But this looks great in a shade garden. Here they have it growing with some euphorbia. So very pretty. This is Clematis. Now everybody's familiar with your standard Clematises and the ones that, you know, maybe get eight feet tall. Uh, and this, but this, now they come out with a lot of these new ones that are bush Clematis. And these bush Clematis still get probably, well, this one says 38, 34 inches. Um, I still use a trellis on them because they tend to, or like put a tomato cage around the outside or so. I, they can get a little maybe floppy-ish, but I just kind of let them trail into the garden also. Really pretty, but they got beautiful seed heads. These are the spent flowers and it just got a lot of great things going for it. Really beautiful, clean foliage too. Deer and rabbit resistant. I always order delphiniums. I personally don't have luck with them, <laughs> but um, I see just beautiful stands of delphinium in people's yard. Now this one will either need to be staked, um, even though these are, these are called the mini stars. So they're a little bit shorter because the really tall stuff, you know, unless you put it against like a garage wall or the side of your house um, in a really stiff wind, phew, they're going to be falling over. But wow, they're spectacular. These are also deer and rabbit resistant. Here's a nice, beautiful stand. And you can see, I love the foliage of them. So when they're done blooming, if you cut them off, they really have attractive foliage. It's very seldom do I order plants that the that the, the uh, foliage looks hideous when it's done because I hate that. Okay, and this is the newest paint that just came out. It's called Lip Gloss. And um, paints have really attractive foliage. They have a really gray, green, strappy foliage. These love full sun, so they'll do best in full sun. And a lot of times when you shear them off after the little flower heads are done, um, they'll, they'll give you a periodic rebloom. So you'll see buds coming up here and there and flowering again. So very, very pretty. Most of these, like I know the big rage is prairie gardens and pollinator gardens and all those. 
these, if it has a flower, it's a pollinator. So anytime you grow anything that flowers, you, you've already got it covered. So the bees, I see pollinators all over my garden. The biggest thing that, that uh, makes things that is dangerous for pollinators is if you use sprays and things. So uh, if you keep your garden uh, just as clean as you can without uh, using sprays and stuff, everything is great for the bees. Here you have some dianthus growing, just kind of cropping up in here. This is a little shadier than I'd probably put them in, but you can see they still do okay in the shade. Here, this looks like delphinium here. <laughs> this guy's really, I mean, he must have, a, he obviously has a protected location because it's right by a woods. So I don't know him. I stole this off the internet, of course. So this is, um, this is the same as your regular old fashioned bleeding heart, except for it has very red stems. And I have one of these and these are really blood red. And instead of having the pink flower, great cottage garden plant, not gonna tell you that it won't seed here and there because it probably will. I don't know if it'll come true to the dark red, but you can just hold those out if they get, if it gets naughty. But uh, this is gonna really be pretty in the garden, beautiful. I think that these can take a lot of sun. They'll take some shade too, but I have mine in too much shade. So I don't, I'm gonna move it this year because I don't think that it's, it could, it could just be more spectacular given the right conditions. This is a Digitalis Candy Mountain. Um, I don't think this is, I think this is the biennial variety. It, it's funny because there are some perennial uh, Digitalis and I think I even purchased one from Racky for the sale, but, um, but you know, they're not near as spectacular as the biennial ones. These have just gigantic flowers. And you know, I think that that's why they're biennial because if the regular perennial version were to flower like this, they wouldn't flower every year. This really, really, really has to uh, put a lot of, um, uh, of, well, it just wears itself out putting out such big flowers. Deer and rabbit resistant. This is the newest Echinacea, which is coneflower. Um, I love these pom-pom ones. I think they just really, really are just outstanding in the garden. And I noticed that they really seem to come back true to form more than the, just the ones with just petals. So uh, this is a really unique color. It's kind of a creamy color in the garden. And I think it's gonna have kind of a two tone effect. So not real tall either, only 18 to 20 inches, which is good because that means it won't flop on you. Deer resistant. This one I just love because it was kind of a newer variety. It's fire finch, but it's got so many different colors in it. I just thought that was really pretty. Um, and it's got a really a neat, like you can see how, how big the cones are. So when this is done flowering and the petals drop off, it still looks kind of cool, like with that orange pom-pom still on the stem. And this is a brand new variety called Rainbow Sherbert. Um, so this one's gonna get a little taller, but it's got another two-tone effect to it. Very, very pretty. Echnops Blue Glow. Yes, I know this is somewhat painful, but <laughs> it is, and actually deer and rabbits don't like it because it's somewhat painful. It's not as, um, it's not as uh, painful as uh, um, the, uh, there's another variety that's like um, shorter and stuff. This one isn't as bad. It's a little bit softer than that, but I have this in my garden and it's the most unusual, absolutely glowing light blue or medium blue. It's very, very difficult color to get in your in a perennial garden. It's a true blue like that. Really pretty, three to four feet. Uh, mine just keeps getting a just beautiful clump of it. I love it. Deer and rabbit resistant. So, and you can see I'm putting all here that what, what the bloom times are. So when you go to make your decisions and stuff, that's why this PowerPoint's nice to get it in advance. So you can kind of, you know, think about what kind of holes you have in your garden and what you want to fill. And it's going to tell you when it's going to bloom. And uh, good old Gallardia here, this is an old variety. I haven't seen them come out with any new <laughs> varieties of Gallardia. I think it's because Gallardia is just great the way it is. So. Um, these will literally, I wouldn't, like if this didn't bloom all summer, I don't think the foliage is that attractive. But because it blooms all summer, it doesn't matter because then you get it, you get just the blooms. But uh, really good performer. This one's going to do best in full sun. Uh, otherwise, it'll tend to flop a little bit. 
So deer resistant also. I love this plant because first of all, it's got the dark foliage. I'm very attracted to that because it's such a good foil with other plants. This here, you can see it's with a goat's beard here. Um, but it's this with that clear blue flower against that, that dark foliage. And this is the toughest little plant I've ever seen. I think I planted one 10 years ago and it has to kind of grow over the top. And one day I was, what I, I mean, I rarely read that much. I should read tons more. I looked under that leaf and here that thing, you know, it's probably been covered up a lot for like eight years and it's still growing. And, um, and these actually do great in containers. I mean, you can put this in a container and just put your container in the, your unheated garage for the winter and you'll come right back. Uh, these were the first thing. I bet you March 1st, I had these in pots and these are already up March 1st. Really tough little plant. Let me talk about hookahs a little bit. Um, so you know more about what makes them tick. You can see this one's in more shade here in a forest or whatever. This is actually, they're actually native to the Northeast forest. Now you can see that this is growing on rock. So that gives you a little idea of how shallow they grow. They, I mean, they don't need a lot of soil to grow. So, uh, but they have come up, I bet there is at least 100 or more, maybe 150 different varieties of hookera. Now, I've cut back on ordering those because literally people are getting tired of them because they think they're too fussy and um, people aren't having good luck with them. And I think that, so I did get a couple of them for people that are still into them, but uh, I always, what comes back from the plant sale, which now last year, I bet you we had 2,500 or 3,000 plants. We only had 40 plants returned from the plant sale. So it was a really successful plant sale, but a lot of the hookahs came back. So it tells me that they're getting tired of, people are getting tired of hookahs because they're not having good luck with them. So they really like more sun than you would ever think. I know they show them growing in the shade, but honestly, a friend of mine grows them and hers are just bushel baskets and they're growing in, I would say, I would actually say it was full sun. And so I think the more sun you give them, the better. These like great drainage because the, the slide I showed you before showed them sitting on a rock growing. That was the native, native hookah. So um, I would give them, this would have a little, I would have this be a little elevated. Her gardens are elevated by about six, eight inches because they have, uh, she just, made them all like that because it's just it just helps for drainage and um they're just gigantic they come back beautifully every year uh so I would say that I think we're just not growing them correctly and this year I didn't experiment because I had grown some left some in pots and put them in uh my uh uh barn which is like only 10 degrees warmer than outside normally and um I went out to look at them and you know, they tend to have a stem that elongates and it, and they had over the summer. And then when I touched them, they were rotten and I'm like, oh, okay. So what I did was, um, I took it, I took that, I broke it off and I cut off all that mushy rotten stuff right down to the crown where I got clean crown. And then I took it and I rubbed it in some rooting hormone and I put it in some, uh, uh, soilless mix. I stuck them in a pot and then I took one of those U-hooks and then I stuck it on top there to hold it tight against the soil. I set it in a dish with water so that I always have about an inch of water in that dish. So they're always wet. God darn it, they're growing like crazy. So, um, and so you can re-root them. So don't just throw them out. If they, I mean, if they look like they, you know, they still have some crown tissue to them. You can start those over again. I'm going to be putting those two that I saved back in the pot again. So, uh, so don't give up on them. These are great plants. So I ordered this one because it was brand new to the market, Red Dragon. And that's the only two I ordered <laughs> because I don't want to have them come back. Uh, you know, they complement each other because one's red and one's gold. And I think they'd be pretty. I wouldn't, I would try them in a pot. I think that that might work. So. It's great drainage. Okay, so see, I want to give you some hope here. This one is with a, it looks like a 
it looks like some kind of a fern, I think. And, or I don't know, maybe a shrub. And then, um, and then with that money wart, but uh, very, very pretty. And then this is a hookerella, which is a tall, which is a cross between a terriella, which is a great woodland plant and a hookera. And I think these do do better than shade conditions. And they seem to be a little hardier, a little easier. They hope, I think they cope better over the winter. So might be something to consider. That's another reason to like hookeras and hookerellas because they are deer and rabbit resistant. So in here, some, I just wanted to show you how, what a great foil these are in the garden. Very, very pretty. And here's some pinks again. I'm not sure, this looks like Cupid's dart, I think. So strawberries, interesting. Okay, so hibiscus. Um, the gal who runs, helps run her plant sale, she loves hibiscus. So I always order hibiscus at her request. Um, now, when you see these at the plant sale, sometimes they look like dead sticks in the pot. And that's because hibiscus doesn't even come out of the, doesn't even start budding till June 1st. And they're really late to come up. A lot of people accidentally kill them because they don't think they're alive and they pull them out. But these are very, very late to bud. So don't pull your hibiscus out of the ground and don't be af afraid to buy the ones that are plant sale that look like they're just dead sticks. Because <laughs> we're gonna look at that root system and if it looks good, you'll have to trust us that we think it's gonna grow. But hibiscus, there's a lot of hybridizing done. I'm seeing them in more and more gardens, really hardy perennial. They do do best in full sun. Uh, and they are another plant that will just knock your socks off in late summer when the gardens are starting to kind of look a little peaked. Now we're gonna have the little, my favorite part, the hosta part. <laughs> so now another thing about the hostas and uh, probably people don't need much cultural information about this, but I know that um, the bluer types do do tend better to do, they do tend to do a little bit better in the garden and a little more shade. And then when you start getting some yellows and things like that in the leaves, they'll do a little bit better and more sun. Um, so now, normally, one new, one new hosta variety is introduced a year. But last year and this year, they must have released six or seven brand new hostas to the market. So instead of getting, I, have, I only bought two old timers because they're really good hostas. And then the rest of these just came out this year. So um, I, I'm sure I'll insist I have to have those. Um, this is gonna be a big boy. It's gonna be a big real estate eater, but it's gonna be really intense, intense blue. So very pretty. This is an older one that's been out for about six or seven years. And this is like out of Niagara Falls, uh, really pretty color. I'm gonna be honest, I don't think it's the easiest one to grow, uh, but uh, I think it's beautiful if you can pull it off. This is another new one called Echo in the Sun. This one's gonna be only 19 inches tall, but I love the ruffly leaves on this and the bright color. This is an older one, but it's always still super popular. Um, it's only 11 inches tall, it fits in the garden well, and it has this a real streaky look to it. Very pretty, this will take shade or sun, some sun. I mean, don't go crazy and put it in blazing heat, but it's, it'll do well with a lot more sun. This one's gonna be huge, but look at those gorgeous leaves. They're just like really giant, look like they're fl fluttering above the stems, very pretty. This one, there's, uh, there's a hosta that's been around for a while called blue mouse ears. Really thick, thick leaves, very slug resistant. Uh, and this is just the one step larger uh, version of the blue mouse ears, which I like this one better because blue mouse ears is just, too small for, for my garden because stuff gets lost in my garden. This one's called Terms of Endearment, brand new to the market this year. Trendsetter, brand new. I think we did pick a few of these up in last fall and sold some. This one's Voices in the Wind. It's not gonna be gigantic, it's only gonna be 17 inches tall, uh, but lots of movement in the leaves, very pretty. When I Dream, Lots of uh, variegation in those leaves. This is going to be big. I think this is going to be, if anybody's ever heard of Great Expectations, I think this is going to be an improvement over Great Expectations. Uh, great Expectations, really hard to grow. I think this one's going to be great. 
The hybridizer who does all this, his name is Hans, Hans Hansen, and he's the leading hybridizer for Walter's Gardens. And he's a hosta master. This one is interesting because we've had other narrow ripply leaf ones, but never they got 22 inches tall. So this one's gonna be really, really a lot of fun in the garden. And now we're gonna talk about hellebores. And here's like a whole bevy of them right here. Beautiful plants. Mine are blooming like crazy right now. I purchased like 30 of them last year and put them in in the fall. I mean, I'm talking late fall because I'm always running behind schedule. Every single one of those is blooming. The deer won't touch these. The rabbits don't like them. And they've been blooming now for two weeks in this weather. In fact, this is in Larry Conrad's yard that he's in El Dorado. He opens his gardens up to people. Um, if you look at Conrad Art Glass and Gardens. If you Google that, you'll, he's got websites. He's got, I mean, he's on Facebook constantly posting great pictures. A lot of people know about him. And I think now he, he's always had a blog. Now he might have his own website. I can't remember. Uh, but this is <laughs> when we got all that snow that didn't phase the hellebore. So here's, um, here's, there's not any, I didn't notice that there was any new ones to the market this year. But when you got such great ones already, uh, I think that uh, they didn't need to do any introductions. But these are some of the ones, favorite ones that have sold last year and the year before. So we've got Sandy Shores, Spanish Flare, First Dance. And, and do know that the, your, uh, your big bumblebees love these. There's not a lot of stuff out right now. I still have seen the bumblebees out but uh, they're looking for uh, flowers that flower this early. And there's very, I think it's only hellebores that are flowering this early. <laughs> so, and uh, these really deer and rabbits do not touch these. There's Maid of Honor, Mother of the Bride, True Love. Okay, now we're into lavender. People are going nuts for lavender. We couldn't grow lavender until five years ago. We were just too cold. It would never winter over. Now, what, lavender is amazing because it'll really literally bloom all summer long. But the thing of it is, is that this needs good drainage also. So you want to give it a little bit like tuck your soil up, maybe like, you know, three to five inches and give it good drainage. And these are just great performers. So, and I, I ordered, we had, we ran out of it. Uh, two years ago, so I ordered extra last year, ran out of it again. So I have two different kinds this year. I have Imperial Gem, which is brand new to the market. And this one is brand new too, called Sensational. And this foliage, the plants that I have in the garage, it, it looks just like this. It's like this. It's really amazing. It's very, very steel blue looking, really intense flowers. I don't think this one, well, any of this will be coming back to my house after the plant sale, I mean. Um, so, and then I got a couple of just your, you know, old fashioned daisies, uh, which is Shasta Daisy, Marshmallow, and this one's brand new to the market called Seventh Heaven. Um, I ordered this um, uh, latris because, oh man, bees go nuts. This, this is a great pollinator plant. It's got really unusual foliage that looks good after the stem, after they're all done blooming. It's, this variety is very pink because a lot of them have my, more of a lavender, pinkish lavender look to it. And, uh, but this one's very, very pink. So this was most likely field grown and then they plucked out the ones that had the best color. So uh, this is one of my absolute favorite plants that they've ever come up with. This is Brit Marie Crawford. I usually order this every year because this is just, this dark foliage in the garden is just such a great foil with echinacea and a lot of other plants. Um, and this is a great indicator plant in your garden too. Because this likes more moisture, when this starts flagging during the day, which means kind of wilting down, and if it stands up at night, you're okay. But if this one doesn't stand up at night, you need to water your whole garden. This is a great plant, plant to tell you what's going on with the soil moisture. So Lobelia, another great you know, there's lots of great, there's uh, native lobelia that is great for uh, prairie gardens. And this is your more cultivar variety. Uh, it's going to attract the same amount of insects. Uh, it's got some great features in these dark red stems with uh, uh, 
great color and um, just really, really vibrant. Deer and rabbit resistant too. Uh, lupine, um, it's just an old fashioned garden plant. I usually order a red one because people, when you buy lupine norm normally, it's a mixture of colors. It's like gambling. You don't know what you're gonna get. So I just order red so you know you're gonna take home a red one. So, and now we got some brand new Monardas. Uh, I noticed that what they're really focusing on is mildew resistance, number one. Uh, this is another mid midsummer blooming plant, blooms for a really long time. Rabbits don't like it, deer don't like it. Uh, they came up with a lot of new varieties, but they've been concentrating a little bit more on darker foliage too, so that the flowers pop better. This one's called Pink Chenille, brand new. And this is the newest red one. I think the other one was like, uh, was there one called, I think Klein was in the name. I can't remember the first name, but this has got really, really purple foliage. And then bright, bright, bright red flowers. Very, very pretty. Uh, Mukdinia, um, I have ordered that years past. Um, it's really unusual. Uh, has great spring color, great fall color, and it blooms. But mostly I order it because of the foliage is fantastic. So, and it's what makes a good ground cover. Uh, it's going to like um, probably, part, I would give it more sun than shade. So. I've seen, I've seen it in um, gardens that the leaves are like this big on it. So, uh, but they had more sun. And I always tell everybody, the difference between a good garden and a great garden isn't fertilizer or anything like that. Well, weeding helps. Um, it's water, watering the plants. Plants need about an inch of water a week. If you, they don't get it, yeah, they'll live without it but they're gonna thrive and look better with it. So um, I ordered some or, ornamental oregano last year and I think every plant came back to my house. I bought every plant and I put it in every planter. I put it in as just like a filler in some flower beds. Uh, and I did it too because the deer and the rabbits hate it. Uh, it does smell just like oregano. And it, it flowers later. So it's another one that will kind of pick your garden up a little later in the season. I think this one has like goldish foliage. So uh, I, thought, I think it's really pretty. I really liked it. I grew it in five pots and put it in the ground in four or five places. Um, now, will it come back? I think it's, it's supposed to. It is rated zone four. Uh, will it seed? I don't know. I'll let you know next year because <laughs> I didn't, I only tested it for one year. But I it was really, really bushy and, and healthy looking. I really loved it. So I, I was surprised so many of them came back. I hope this year people will buy them and use them for, if not pot fillers, um, just use them, squish them into your perennial bed somewhere. And maybe you can discourage some uh, rabbits with it. Uh, here's uh, just an oriental poppy. I like it's just, just such a good cottage garden plant. Um, Penstemon, Midnight Masquerade. Uh, once again, the, the uh, dark foliage with the uh, lavender flowers there. And some, this is the brand new uh, Russian sage. They seem to come out with a new one almost every year, but I really don't know what the difference is. <laughs> but it said it was new, so I thought we should have it. Um, this one is still going to get 30 or 36 inches. It might be bushier. It sure looks bushier there, but I thought we'd give it a try. And the garden flocks. This one is the Glamour Girl. Uh, we totally sold out of that last year. So I thought, well, for those who didn't get lucky enough to get one, I, we tried again. And this one is brand new to the market called Sunset Coral. And this one is just, the flowers will be two-tone like this. It'll be at dusk. Uh, this can be very similar to Nikki, which is an old fashioned variety. At dusk, that one I have in my garden, it just glows. And I noticed that this Nikki, this isn't Nikki, but it's very similar. When that Nikki seeds, it seeds true to the color that it is. I was shocked. So anyway, but this is uh, really, really beautiful. Uh, just a nice balloon flower. They're kind of a fun old fashioned garden, kite garden plant. And little gold star. It's not as tall and not floppy like uh, like your other black-eyed Susan. Stays a little closer to the ground. 
my favorite salvia that I always order every year because some salvias are, um, I like May night. Every, that thing always poof, splits in half. And lay, the two halves lay on the ground when it's done blooming. And May night also has all these bracts are like brown and bad looking. You have to cut them off to clean the plant up. This one, you don't have to trim it. Give it full sun so it stays really bushy like this. But see the the stems are red and the brackets that hold the flowers are red also. So when this is done flowering, you don't have to trim it. It's still going to be attractive. And that's what I love about this. Now, if you do trim it, you'll send out side shoots with brand new bloom. And the other salvias will do that too. But I just, I don't always have time to get out in the garden and do all that deadheading. So this is my absolute favorite. This has been around for many, many years. Super garden worthy. Really smells terrible. But that's why the deer and the rabbits don't like it. Uh, but that's what's kind of cool because if you put some of those plants around your garden, it might discourage some of your creepier creepers. Uh, Spigelli, I have a hard time getting my hands on this. There's crop failure every year. They did send it this year, so we have it. Uh, this is a native plant. Now, of course, they've taken the native and they just made the blooms redder, bigger, more of them. Uh, really, really fantastic plant. I've had mine in the garden for, oh, at least seven or eight years now. It comes back every year. Rabbits, I will tell you rabbits eat this because they ate mine off last year. It was very, very irritated. So I'm going to put a little cage around it this year. Uh, very, very pretty. Super garden worthy. Tractor foliage too. And here, I haven't ordered a steakies for a long time, which is betony. Um, I just think that it just is really, really cute, bouncy flowers. The, the foliage is clean looking. So when it's done flowering, it still looks like a great ground cover. Uh, very garden worthy. And I was showing you some steakies in the garden here. Very pretty. Some delphiniums. This is catmint. Got some alliums in here. Very, very pretty combination. Veronica, um, this was brand new to the market, so I thought we'd try it. Uh, Veronica's tend to be, they can be a little on the mildewy side. I don't know what this one's going to do because it's brand new. Um, I'll probably purchase one just out of curiosity, but I love the pale blue flowers. Very pretty. And these will, when you trim these back, these will be blue. And Viola, this is quite different. One of our members always loves me to order some violas, but this one is a uh, birdfoot violet and it's got really, really, really cut little kind of grassy foliage, very pretty. And this will bloom very early. Okay, so I'm gonna go through some racky stuff, but I've only got a few slides because there's too many plants. So I'm gonna show you some of my favorites that I ordered from racky and then you can just look at the list um, after it's published. So this is American Pass Flower. Really beautiful, uh, very, very, I mean, this is actually a cultivar off of a woodland plant. And then if we get it, I love this plant. I've seen it in someone's garden where the leaves are two feet across. This is Estaboldes tubularis. Uh, it's kind of in the uh, Regersia family. So it's got, it usually has like whitish flowers. This one should, the more sun you give it, the bigger the leaves will be. I mean, it'll be maybe not real big, but you've got to give it a lot of water. So you've got to put this by the hose. So it'll do the best, but it's it's a unique, exotic looking plant. Uh, Astrantia, um, a little bit hard to find in the trade. That's why I ordered it, but it has beautiful foliage. This is more of a kind of a shade garden plant, really pretty kind of like Scabosia type flowers. This is, this is and it, the shades can vary a lot. So it can go from light pink to this red, to the deeper red. And you can see it has a neat to two-tone effect, but has really clean ground cover type foliage. So it's when it's done blooming, it's still very valuable in the garden. And the uh, Campanula, um, just, it's like a, it's very, very covered with blue flowers. This is a really old fashioned kite garden plant called Centranthus. This one um, will be just, fantastic for pollinators. There'll be so many, many bees and other insects all around this plant. One of my favorite Coreopsis is still Moonbeam. I love that soft, 
soft buttery yellow color on it. It's got thread leafed foliage, which is really unique in the garden. Here's like a whole swaths of it there. It looks beautiful with this uh, Russian sage and Laetrus right here in the background. You've got coneflower and grasses back here. Very well done. Uh, I was so excited because I went out in my garden and I planted three of these last year and they're all coming back. And I love these, uh, the petals that are back facing. And then they have the uh, beautiful cones on this one. And this is a, uh, uh, this is a, this is a prairie plant. And I got a couple of the goat beards this year. This is the one that gets 48 inches tall. This is really beautiful foliage. And the flowers are great, sort of. I think they're pretty, but this is, this will grow in deep shade and it'll be, it'll flower like crazy, but it's almost shrub-like when it's done blooming. Very, very pretty in the garden. I've had mine for years and years. And this is a dwarf. I have these in a, in a, in a, we have a little place up north and I have these in a sandy mound and they just, they've been in that mound for 15 years. They keep coming back every year and the deer don't eat them. And this is the true perennial digitalis or box club. This one actually is, and you can see the difference. See how these have, I mean, it's still really pretty and delicate and stuff but it's not gonna be like the biennial one where it's just loaded with flowers. This one's just gonna be more delicate. But these foxgloves have really great, really great foliage. So you can see almost every plant I ordered has, has it's not gonna look bad after it's done blooming. You cut it back and you'll be very shrub-like and really pretty. And I got some dog, if they come, because <laughs> react piece is a little bit, there, this is not a new plant. I just put new because I'd never ordered it for the plant sale before. Uh, Racky, sometimes we get it, sometimes we don't. Um, and that's like with any any company we buy from because, you know, I'll get a notice and it'll be crop failure. And I think that's called crop failure or I sold too many and didn't keep track of them. I haven't ordered this for years and this is Painted Daisy. So, but it's got really cute feathery, ferny type foliage. Nadia, we haven't ordered for a long time. So this will bloom and bloom and bloom. This is uh, this is your uh, 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 Joe Pye weed, but this is the short form. It doesn't get, it maybe gets four feet tall instead of eight feet tall. So it doesn't flop, but also red stems, really clean looking, great foliage, very pretty. Little later in the season blooming. So you have a little more color later. Uh, Karinja Shoma. Uh, Palmata, this is really a pretty shade garden plant. Uh, you'll get three to four feet, uh, has these really tubular flowers. So hummingbirds love this plant. And this gives you hummingbird food later into the season too, because that's when, you know, things are not flowering as well. Really gorgeous plant in or out of flower, very deer resistant. And Regersias, I think I'll earn a couple of those. I don't know why more people don't put these in their garden. They're really phenomenal. They have very textured leaves, uh, you know, very divided. They have like pinkish white flowers on them. Uh, the spring color is bronze, the fall color is bronze. So a lot of go lot going on for this. This can get quite large, like, well, this is 32 inches tall, at least you'll get that. Here's one in the summer, you can see that the bronze foliage kind of goes away and it becomes green. And this is the flowering habit. Transincantia sweet cater spiderwort. I love the foil of the yellow with the blue. These I like to say buy in bloom because they can, this flower color can go from lavender to deep blue. So I like to see those in bloom, but um, so buy a couple of them and maybe you'll get one blue one. So here's the rainbow zand. Here's the hookra. Uh, this looks like, I'm not sure what, that is, this looks like a fern here, another hosta, and really pretty garden setting. And then if you put all this together correctly, these will be your neighbors lining up to get into your garden and see what you, what you bought at the plant sale. Okay, so this is the list of the things. I had some pictures, then those are ordered too, and that those will be on this list. But you can see it's a really huge list of other stuff that... I bought from Radkeys that we're hoping to get. And there's climbing hydrangea in there. Uh, there's like three different kinds of lilies. Um, there's 
lot, there's more, a lot of different phloxes. There's some shrubs, uh, some raspberry. I think that um, we had uh, gojo, goji berry, gooseberry. So we really got a big variety from there and I'm hoping we're gonna get most of it. I did order a wild bergamot, which is that lavender color. And there you go. That's the uh, advertisement for, um, for our plant sale and also the wild ones and the Paper Valley Garden Club. We have our sales all on the same day. So you'll have a fun day hitting every one of those sales. And we all sell kind of different things. I mean, wild ones will be obvious. It'll be prairie plants. Uh, the Paper Valley Garden Club will sell a lot of things they've dug up from their yard. Uh, and then we'll sell a lot of we'll have our plants will be purchased from uh, from uh, from growers from the growers that's, that we pot up. Okay, so we'll be taking questions now. We have a couple questions. If you have them, drop them in the Q&A and we'll get to them. Um, the first one is, when can perennials that have been shipped by growers be put out and planted? Um, I would say you can plant them as soon as you bring them home from the plant sale. All right. Because um, I'm going to have them outside this weekend. <laughs> so, um, you know, obviously there was one year that in, I think it was like May, the middle of May, it might've been like May 13th or May 15th, that it got 18 degrees. Wow. So what I'm gonna say is that um, you're gonna purchase these on May 20th. And then if you look at your forecast for the next 10 days and it's above freezing, plant them right away. Now, when they're in the pots, when you pull them out of the pot that soon, they're gonna be basically plugged still, like I showed you in that picture. That's not a problem, but not, nothing's easier than putting a plug in the garden because you have to dig such a, sm a small hole. Um, so put them in right away. And they, you know, our, our plants are smaller than we're not growing, getting them in February and growing them on like a regular greenhouse. They're smaller, but they're not going to be smaller. They're going to be, they're, they, they're getting the exact same thing but they're growing them sooner, but they have to charge more because they're paying to heat their greenhouse. So we're giving you a great deal on the same plant that they're buying, all the greenhouses. So uh, don't be afraid to take that out of the pot and put it right in the ground, not a problem. So then somebody's asking, what would you recommend for clay soil? Um, Echinaceous for sure. Uh, I'm not, Really and truly, I'm never intimidated by the clay soil. The problem with clay is that if it dries out, it's actually very nutrient rich. So, but it, I would mulch it and I'd put a couple, of, a couple inches of mulch on that soil and then uh, make sure it doesn't dry out. Things will grow great. And if by mulching it, you're transforming that soil. I had you know, at least like, it seemed like every 10 years since I've lived here, we've had to dig up a water main that went from our barn to our house and it brought up all the clay soil. And I would just replant the plants in that clay soil and mulch it. And after like five years, it was, you know, the worms will bring it all down into the, they'll, they'll make that compost for you. So uh, just remember when you're buying mulch, a lot of your jumping worms are coming in that bag mulch. And that's what I heard. So, and that's a whole different talk on the jumping worms. But uh, so beware when you're buying the bag mulch. Now, purchasing the mulch from a big yard that, you know, is cutting trees, that's, I, I would pretty much think that would be free of, of uh, jumping worms. So just something to know. Someone, Michelle, is asking, do you know if any of these are toxic to pets? I would, I, you know Pets are pretty smart. I just don't, I've never had a problem. I've always had dogs, always have cat, had had cats. I've never had a pet get sick. And I have a lot of different perennials. I mean, all the stuff I show you, I buy, if you go and talk to the girls at the flat sale, I probably their biggest customer. I buy so many different perennials. I never, ever noticed that. I mean, you'd have to Google each plant that you're buying or the, take something off the list and Google it for that particular concern because I've never had a problem, not once. And I have hundreds and hundreds of uh, different perennials. Okay, so somebody said, what if I have received plants from catalogs within the last week? Can they be planted now or should I wait? I would wait until the lowest temperature is going to be about 
35 or 40 at night. So overnight, you're, I, I think the best would be your overnight temperature is 40 or above. Now, another thing said is that, you know, soil temperature and temperature outside are different things. So I things will grow better when the temperature of the soil is for sure above 50 degrees. So if you want to take a thermometer out there and make sure your soil is over 50 degrees, and then you want to get it in right away, um, you can also, um, you know, put a pot upside down on it to keep it warmer. But I would say that's, that's usually my rule of thumb is 40 and above at night. I bought a Spanish lavender a few years ago and have had trouble finding it since. Is it not successful in our area? Spanish lavender? I don't think I'm familiar with that. Hmm. So um, lavenders weren't, they weren't, we couldn't grow them until like maybe, maybe five years ago. Um, and lavenders are also, they're not, I mean, I see them in people's yard, they'll have them for years. But I like to have, see them have great drainage. If they don't have good drainage, they will rot. So it's probably gone. And I, I'll have to be honest with you. I have not, I don't have a lot of full sun in my yard. And so I really don't grow lavender. I well, would the question lavender that sun. I would have had is where did they get the Spanish lavender yeah, from? I think and if it was a be, southern grower, it probably yes. isn't hard to hear. And you'd be surprised how many people will go on vacation. They'll be in South Carolina and they'll bring something home. I, I can be accused of that. I went on vacation to Colorado and I brought home something that just really go grows in, you know, in that kind of, uh, in, I mean, in very dry situations like Colorado and I lost it. So um, I, I'm not familiar with Spanish lavender. I'm sorry. Okay. Besides hosta, list your top 10 favorite all-time plants. <laughs> oh my gosh. Of course. Well, you can tell when I give these presentations that all of them are my favorite. <laughs> um, I love Ligularia, every form of Ligularia. That that besides Hosta, Ligularia would be probably way up there for me. Um ooh, I have been growing a lot of uh um I have been starting to grow a lot of uh what do you want to call it? Um uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. uh, lady slippers. <laughs> so that, but those are expensive and they're touchy too, but I have had so far, I've had good luck with them. Um, I love peonies because peonies are, uh, give you such a, such a great garden experience because they have good, great foliage. Um, I love woodland peonies. Um, you have to mail or I mail order a lot of stuff. I love clematis. I mean, I love bush clematis. So I like, I, I mean, I like, there isn't a plant on here that I showed you that I don't really, really like. And so, uh, and, or that I have a trial that I think is going to do well in your garden. Um, I think early on, maybe 15 years ago, I would buy some stuff that I had wasn't, you know, that, that I thought, well, let's try this, but I don't do that anymore. Now I look at the pedigree and make sure it's going to be garden worthy. So there isn't uh, any plant on here that I don't really wouldn't recommend or don't like. I love them all. So maybe I like 150 varieties. <laughs> Andrea has a couple of um, plant sale questions. She said, are all the new plant varieties available at all three sales? And are the prices reasonable? Um, no, that I know because the, the wild ones is going to have prairie plants. So those are not going to be new plants at all because prairie plants are old, old, old fashioned plants out of prairies. I don't know what the garden club's going to have, but I can tell you what we're going to have. And we're going to have the plants I showed you on this, on this, uh, on, on all these slides until we got to radkeys. Now radkeys, I'm hopeful. So I ordered really early. I ordered like two days after I get the catalogs. I'm hoping we're going to get most of those, but they notoriously don't send us everything. Um, but what I showed you on this PowerPoint is what we're going to have. And those are some of the newest varieties on the market and most garden worthy too. So, um, someone's asking, what are the best aromatic plants? Plants that smell good? Well, lavender would be one. I love the way bee balm smells. Um, 
I don't think I ordered one this year, but I like uh, anise hyssop is really, really well, uh, is very fragrant. Um, another plant that I have in my garden that I love for fragrance is um, dictamus, which is, um, oh, what's the other name of that one? Doesn't have really any good name. Gas plant. It's called gas plant. Mm -hmm. We don't have it because it's really, really hard to get in the trade because it's tap ready. So I'm trying to start some from seed. I have plants of dictamus, but I'm trying to start them from seed. Some people tell me they have seedlings all over the yard from the plant. I wasn't that lucky. So uh, I mostly, I have mostly hostas. I probably have, I probably have like 1500 different varieties of hostas. So I have lots and lots of hostas and I start seedlings of hostas from plants I hybridize or get seed from other hybridizers and I start 625 new ones every year. So that's what was on the side of my garage is all those seedlings. Um, that's kind of a passion for me, but I do have, uh, I love phlox and they're not, not for the fragrance, but um, I do love the way phlox look in the garden too. Um, as far as pricing goes, I think our prices are, we don't, we keep them as reasonable as we can to make a, a small profit so that we can take that money and put it back in the community. So when you're buying from us, no one's getting rich. <laughs> we're just putting that money in and helping others with that money. So um, I think that we're a good place to buy because of that. And, and the prices are really good. Some of the, those hostas that I showed you um, online from regular uh, that people that just specialize in that, they'll be $35 a piece. And I think ours are between seven and 12. So, and they're the same ones that other people are selling. I mean, you know, like people that specialize in hostas, uh, cause I mail order a lot of them, but this year I won't have to, cause we have some fantastic ones here that I'm going to be buying from our plant sale. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it. That looks like all our questions. Thanks, Kathy. You make me You're excited welcome. to like buy plants and I hope so. I hope <laughs> so. <laughs> well, come and check it out. And I, I don't think, well, we must be doing a good job if we if we put out 3,000 plants and only 40 come back. That's yeah, pretty, that's pretty good. We must be doing a great job. So, I mean, of, of selling at that plant sale. Pray for good weather. Yeah. Thank you. And Tom, do you want to tell us what's next for Master Gardener Presents? Yes. Uh, next month is I'll be talking about container gardening, and that will be the, the last through the Kimberly Library for this season. However, when you're at the plant sale, take a look to the south and you'll see a whole series of gardens back there. So basically Master Gardener Presents is going to be moving outside for the summer. And this is gonna be sponsored uh, in cooperation with the Appleton Public Library starting in June and going through September. So, uh, when you're at, like I said, when you're at the plant sale, walk back there and take a look and you'll get a little preview of what the Summer Master Gardener Presents series is going to be all about. So hope to see you there. Thank you. Sounds exciting. I'm glad they're keeping going. Thank you, uh, everybody. One other thing, if anybody wants to become a Master Gardener, uh, you can get a hold of us by uh, Googling how to give me master gardeners and uh, you'll get to our website and we, uh, we can get you into the program. Awesome. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to close this thing. I hope you're all ready to buy your plants. <laughs>